Hello and good morning. My name is Dr. Patrick O'Reilly and I'm chair of the psychology forum at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco. I will be your moderator for today's program. I am pleased to be in conversation today with my longtime friend, Dr. Jamie Scott, who will be talking about conspiracy theory. Dr. Scott is the former executive director of the National Center for Science Education, a not-for-profit membership organization of scientists, teachers, and others that work to improve the teaching of science as a way of knowing, the teaching of evolution, and the, and, uh, the teaching of climate change. Um, let's see, Dr. Scott um, is an internationally known expert on the creationism versus evolution controversy and science denialism, and is called upon by the press and others media to explain science to the general public. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Scott. I'm looking forward to your talk and it's all yours. Thank you. Okay, Patrick, it's a delight to be back here. Um, those of you who are watching this uh, on YouTube, uh, do take a moment if you can to um, go over to the Commonwealth Club website and, and uh, give these folks a donation. The Commonwealth Club is, is an absolute uh, treasure to the Bay Area and actually nationally, because uh, you have access to all of their wonderful programs online here. <clears throat> all right. 1967, John Williams, African-American author, wrote a novel, but he wasn't getting very much publicity about it. And he was concerned that he needed to uh, do something to get some recognition for his uh, hard work. So what he ended up doing is copying a bunch of chapters from the book and leaving them randomly on streetcar on, on subways in New York, New York City. His book was about the King Alfred plan, which was a final solution to the black question, as he put it. It involved a plot of an international uh, genocidal conspiracy to exterminate everyone around the world of African descent. Pretty soon, Black people all over the city were talking about the plan. In other words, he unintentionally seeded a conspiracy theory. A conspiracy theory is the idea that someone or a group of someone's acts secretly with the goal of achieving power, wealth, influence, or some other benefit. Important components are secrecy and benefit to the conspirators. Conspiracy theories have nefarious goals. And even if in 1967 there wasn't an international conspiracy to kill all black people, Martin Luther King was under surveillance from the government. The FBI had its counterintelligence program, COINTELPRO, which spied on both the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. It wasn't entirely unreasonable for people in Harlem to ask questions about King Alfred's plan. The details, especially the complexity of the plan, on the other hand, might have made people suspicious, which I will return to later on. There are real conspiracies. Volkswagen really did conspire to fake emissions tests on its cars. Cigarette, cigarette manufacturers, of course, are legendary for their conspiracy to withhold information on tobacco and cancer, heart disease, and other illnesses. The FBI really did spy on the anti-war and civil rights movements in the 1960s and 70s. Hey, this is Northern California. There are probably people watching this now who are in the FBI files. The National Security Agency really did spy on U.S. citizens. Thank you, Mr. Snowden. The Public Health Service really did conspire to withhold medical treatment to black patients with syphilis between the 1930s until the 1970s. There are real conspiracies. And belief in conspiracies is a very American pastime, and it's not just restricted to people in tinfoil hats. A study looking at conspiracy views between 2006 and 2011 found that 55% of Americans believe in at least one conspiracy, 27% believe two conspiracies, and 12% believe three or more. Uh, in this particular survey, they asked about conspiracies concerning the Iraq War, Barack Obama's birthplace, the 2008 financial crisis, chemtrails, George Soros, and compact fluorescent bulbs which spy on you, which is a conspiracy they made up just to see if anybody would um, claim to have heard about it. 
Another 2013 poll on consp conspiracies showed different conspiracies and the percentage of Americans who believe them. That last column there on the slide is the estimated number of people believing each conspiracy given the percentage of adherents. Half of Americans believe that JFK's assassination was a conspiracy and 44% believe President Bush intentionally misled on Iraq's weapons of mass, mass destruction. But most of the conspiracies asked about fortunately have fewer followers. Only 7% believe that the moon landing was faked, although still that's almost 22 million people. And at the bottom, as many as 12 million Americans believe that lizard people from outer space control politics. And each of those 12 million people has one vote, something to remember in the year 2020. I'd venture to say that even if there are real conspiracies, the majority of ones people embrace are not actual conspiracies or minimally are exaggerated. The title of my talk is the first part of an aphorism that describes most conspiracies, especially the kind we're seeing in abundance today. It's very difficult to find a black cat in a dark room, especially when the cat isn't there. So how do you tell when there's real conspiracy and when you're dealing with false ones? Well, sometimes it's not difficult. If someone believes the planet is run by shape-shifting lizard people from the constellation Draco, you just might start looking for the tinfoil hat. Um, in case you don't know about lizard people, these uh, shapeshifters first landed among us during uh, uh, the time of the ancient Egypt, and they have been manipulating human history since then. On the other hand, have you looked closely at the hall of the pontifical audiences in Rome? The architect who designed it is famous for his simple curved designs, but look closely. The shape is subtle, isn't it? See that stained glass window on the side? On the inside, it becomes even clearer what that stained glass represents. And in case you missed it, that's what it represents. The only conclusion one could possibly come to is that the Pope is also a lizard person, much like other powerful international figures. But seriously, how do you tell the difference between what Robert Brotherton called prudent paranoia there are conspiracies, sometimes they are out to get you, and believing in absurdities like the lizard people or the flat earth. And of course, it's not a dichotomy, it's a continuum. The tinfoil hat end of the continuum is usually pretty clear, but what about the stuff in the middle or even toward the real end, things that you don't know very much about? The current pandemic has spawned a remarkable number and complexity of conspiracies, and Taking them seriously, especially the alleged cures, can have serious consequences. How do you evaluate these claims? How do you tell the difference between prudent paranoia and absurdity? Well, it turns out the conspiracies on the reptilian end of that continuum tend to have a set of characteristics that help you identify them. One characteristic of a conspiracy theory is that it's a closed belief system, no evidence, is sufficient to change minds. Any refuting evidence is dismissed as the conspirators faking evidence to lead us astray. And similarly, it's common that there's no supporting evidence for the conspiracy. And this is where cover-ups come in. Cover-ups are a necessary component of a conspiracy. How else would a conspiracy be maintained if someone weren't destroying evidence, keeping those in the know from talking and so on? So Jack Ruby shot John Fitzgerald Kennedy's assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, not because Ruby was a quirky wannabe mobster, police department hanger on who greatly admired Kennedy, but because the mafia or Cubans or the CIA or Lyndon Johnson or fill in the blank had hired Oswald to kill JFK and they needed Ruby to shut up Oswald so he wouldn't reveal the conspiracy. Attribution errors are also characteristic of conspiracies. Everything about the event or situation is the result of the conspiracy rather than coincidence or unrelated causes. An example comes from the anti-climate change community regarding the so-called medieval warming period and the Little Ice Age. The delightfully named, if wrongheaded, Minnesotans for Global Warming, hey, I grew up in the upper Midwest, I can see where they're coming from here. You ever gone through a January in Wisconsin or Minnesota? You might be persuaded. At any rate, these uh, climate 
change deniers claim that climate scientists are trying to bury evidence for the medieval warm period. So what is the medieval warm period? Well, it's a period from about 950 to about 1250 and the time of the Viking settlement of Greenland. Now the weather was warmer than it is today and it was easier to grow European crops in Greenland than previously. So there was a settlement. The medieval warm period was followed by a cooler period called the Little Ice Age, peaking in the 1500s and 1600s. And as the Little Ice Age ramped up, so also ended the Norse occupation of Greenland. Now, people who dismiss anthropogenic global warming contend that because the medieval warm period is before the Industrial Revolution, it's not anthropogenic. Present day warming, they say, then is just cyclical and not due to human activity. Therefore, Climate scientists have to conspire to pretend that there was no medieval warm period because they know it disproves that global warming is anthropogenic. Now, deniers point to this diagram in the 1990 report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was based on, of course, 1980s data, and was described as a schematic showing temperatures relative to the beginning of the 20th century. That's the dotted line there. Uh, so the medieval warm period temperatures were higher than the early 20th century, the Little Ice Age was lower. But notice that there's no scale on the y-axis. In later IPCCs, this schematic diagram disappeared, which of course only helped feed the idea of a conspiracy to do away with the medieval warm period, which they believe uh, uh, destroys the idea of anthro anthropogenicity. Is that a real word? of modern global warming. Now here's the 1990 IPCC schematic in red, superimposed over more recent data of climate scientists from ice cores, lake sediments, um, uh, dendrochronology, and so forth. The more recent data show the medieval warm period and the little ice age are reduced considerably from the estimates during the 1990 IPCC. It's also the case that scholarship since 1990, which, you know, if it's 30 years ago, right? suggests that the medieval warm period was not a global phenomenon, but a regional one. During the time of the medieval warm period, Northern Europe and some other parts of the Northern Hemisphere were warmer than today, but the planet as a whole wasn't warmer. In fact, large parts of the planet were cooler than those geographic regions are today. And of course, when you look at the measurement of climate around the globe during the last decade, the situation looks quite different. The average temperature of the planet, not just a region of the planet, is actually substantially warmer now than it was during the medieval warm period. But the point here is that the climate change deniers are attributing the disappearance of the medieval warm period to nefarious climate scientists trying to prolong the hoax of global warming. Whereas there's another simpler and considerably more likely explanation, and that is that the science changed. There were more data, there were better data, there were better models to put those data into, and conclusions changed. It's kind of how you do science. It's pretty you know, meat and potatoes, apple pie, normal way science is done. You change your conclusions with new data and models. There's no need to infer a nefarious plot. Conspiracies often showcase heroic victims who bravely stand against the forces of evil in the face of persecution. Most people are sympathetic to heroic victims. Americans really like underdogs. It's an effortless way to build support for the conspiracy. There often are heroes in controversies over real conspiracies who reveal the conspiracy and they are not uniformly persecuted. An example is Peter Buxton the public health service employee who blew the whistle on the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, who apparently was not persecuted for doing so. And in fact, he is a true hero. Conspiracy theories are notoriously convoluted as they must be to retain a closed belief system. Recall the self-sealing nature of a conspiracy theory. Conspiracy believers look at the lack of supporting data or the presence of refuting evidence as proof of their position. It's just evidence that the conspirators, conspiratorial masterminds are covering things up or manipulating the data. Every bit of contradictory evidence has to be explained away, either through denial or special pleading. This results in conspiracies becoming more and more convoluted and consequently less and less probable. 
The 9-11 truthers deny that al-Qaeda coordinated an attack on Washington and the World Trade Center on September 11 in favor of the idea that it was an inside job orchestrated by the Bush administration with various contributions by the Israelis and sometimes the so-called deep state and sometimes others. But, you know, people saw airplanes flying into these buildings, so that fact needs to be explained away. Truthers believe that the heat generated by the planes wouldn't have been enough to make the World Trade Center buildings collapse. There had to be a demolition. Now, demolitions of the kind to make buildings fall make very loud explosive noises, and no loud explosive noises were recorded on 9-11. So the claim is that thermite was used. And if you've ever seen a Bruce Willis movie, you've seen lots of thermite. So the buildings are 110 stories and thermite would need to be placed in several places on several floors. So first, the government would have had to arrange for several trucks worth of explosives to be trucked into the World Trade Center. Then teams had to install the thermite or whatever was used at several positions on all or many of the 110 floors and wire it to go off. Then there had to be a signal to instigate the thermite, all of which would require more secret agents. And as a cover, 19 hijackers were recruited, trained over a period of many months, and coordinated with the teams planning explosives because the thermite had to be primed to go off in coordination with the planes flying into the buildings. The amount of organization and timing required for this scenario has never been seen before or since. But one characteristic of conspiracy thinking is that the conspirators are fiendishly clever and powerful. By the way, Al-Qaeda is really cheesed at the 9-11 truthers because they want credit for their martyrs. And as if all of this isn't sufficiently convoluted or complicated, truthers also believe that it wasn't an airplane that flew into an obscure part of the Pentagon, but a missile. Similarly, the plane that crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, actually never crashed there at all, but flew to Ohio, where the passengers mysteriously disappeared. This, of course, requires scores, if not hundreds more individuals being in on the conspiracy and managing to keep quiet about it for decades. If Occam's razor is choosing the simplest explanation, the truthers and other conspiracy theorists, theorists are employers of Occam's duct tape, patching together piece after piece of information and misinformation to make an impossibly convoluted story. And that leads us to the next characteristic. A consequence of the convolution problem is that because grand conspiracies like the 9-11 truthers require so many moving pieces and so many individuals being in on the conspiracy, that it's simply impossible that the conspiracy could remain hidden for any length of time. The bigger the conspiracy, the more people involved, the more varied the dedication of the participants in the conspiracy, and the longer it is maintained, the greater the probability that it will be discovered. There's actually a scholarly paper that calculates the probability of um, the revealing of a conspiracy based on these variables like length of time, number of individuals, complexity, convolution, and so forth. I think the, I think the conclusion is that it's really, really improbable that any conspiracy is going to hang around for more than about four years. But that's somebody's accidentally going to let things slip sooner or later. Grand conspiracies are too big not to fail because three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead. Note also that many American-based conspiracies involve the government, which is an institution not famous for its ability to keep a secret. One of the more bizarre governmentally-based conspiracies is QAnon, a conspiracy about the government that started a few years ago on an internet site called 4chan. They believe that there is a new world order of evil criminal masterminds composed of previous presidents, world leaders, CEOs, entertainers, the NSA, and the rest of the alleged deep state and the media. This criminal conspiracy is responsible for all the wars, genocides, poverty, lost jobs, everything bad that has happened to Americans since the presidency of Ronald Reagan, whom they consider the last good president. In most versions, the conspirators also run a child sex trafficking ring. QAnon actually grew out of Pizzagate, but has absorbed other conspiracies as well. An individual calling himself Q 
named because of his top secret clearance, <clears throat> sends coded messages to followers, directing and informing them. Now, these messages tend to be quite Nostradamus-like in their uh, uh, nature. They're very vague. Um, they can be read any number of ways and tend to be. Now, <clears throat> a shadowy group of military officers led by Q secretly recruited Donald Trump to help fight against this evil criminal conspiracy. This is not my slide. I'm not that good at PowerPoint. This is from one of the QAnon sites. The military is going to round up the bad guys one of these days in an action they refer to as the storm and send them to Guantanamo. Now, QAnon, interestingly, interestingly enough, is a conspiracy about a conspiracy, which is kind of fun. But let's just consider the criminal conspiracy of bad guys, <clears throat> the political leaders, business tycoons, celebrities, etc. These evildoers must be remarkably coordinated. And the convolution and too big to not fail problems emerge again. The image of George Soros and Bill Gates sitting down to plot the next series of wars seems a bit stretched, but remember they have to coordinate with all of the world leaders, media, and celebrities, and not just American media, not just the New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, but Le Monde, Pravda, the BBC, Asahi, and the rest of the international media as well. And they have to coordinate with Tom Hanks and Oprah Winfrey and other celebrities. And somehow all of this coordination has never been leaked except by this mysterious cue and his highly interpretable messages to the faithful. We started this train of thought to try to sort out the different ends of this continuum. Real conspiracies exist, of course, but they're not uncovered by people approaching the subject in the manner I just described. Instead, they're uncovered by individuals with, indeed, a healthy skepticism of the received point of view, that's important, but followed by careful collection and evaluation of evidence, including, which rarely happens uh, among the conspirators, evidence against the conspiracy being true. Lewandowski and Cook's Conspiracy Theory Handbook has a useful chart that summarizes this in two columns. Conventional thinking is characterized by a healthy skepticism as opposed to overriding suspicion and so forth. Probably the most important element of this comparison is the contrast between striving for coherence that's important in uncovering an actual conspiracy versus accepting contradictory information as part of the closed belief system that is a conspiracy theory. The reptilian end of the continuum seems to be populated with people content with the contradictory hodgepodge of Occam's duct tape. In fact, if you want to boil it down to only one phrase, look for internal consistency. If it's not internally consistent, it's probably not on the tobacco manufacturer's Tuskegee syphilis end of the continuum. Well, there are so many other issues involving conspiracies that would be interesting to me anyway, uh, and fun to talk about, but my time here in my formal presentation is limited. There's a large scholarly literature on conspiracies. I suggest you do a little Googling. You can find some very good books and many, many articles of people who study conspiracies and conspirators. I do want to take a very short look at that last bullet, though, because it is important for us to pay attention to conspiracies. Conspiracies have consequences, today perhaps more than ever, given digital communications and how quickly information is passed around. There's a trailer for a movie called Plandemic. The trailer, and we assume the unseen movie, purports to relate a WHO NIH big pharma conspiracy to let COVID-19 spread in order to gin up a need for a vaccine from which they would profit. Remember that the definition of a conspiracy involves secrecy and nefarious belief to the conspirator, so certainly pandemic fits right in. YouTube took down the trailer for this movie because the health claims presented would be injurious to believers, although if you mouse around a little bit, you can find this trailer. They make the claim in this um, uh, trailer, for example, that uh, face, masks, face masks activate coronaviruses. They don't. Uh, that's not how. They, <laughs> just imagine all the physicians, nurses, uh, dentists, uh, dental assistants, veterinarians, the people who wear ma face, baths, face masks 365 days a year, not just during pandemics. Uh, they all seem to be okay. Um, 
Another uh, good suggestion from this uh, uh, trailer is that beaches should be opened in during the pandemic because of the quote, healing microbes in ocean and salt water. Don't count on it. And of course, there is an heroic victim, virologist Judy Mikovich, who is presented as having been persecuted by Anthony Fauci, among other scientific establishment characters. In May 2020, President Trump's son, Eric Trump, posted a tweet exhorting people to attend the June rally in Tulsa. Note the Q watermark behind the flag and at bottom the hashtag WWG1WGA, which is a QAnon slogan for when we go one, we go all a phrase to encourage people to work together to overthrow the bad guys. And this is not the first time Trump supporters have played with QAnon iconography, and such references reinforce the idea that Trump is the chosen one to save America from an evil criminal conspiracy of powerful people. By the way, Q is believed by many to actually be the now 101-year-old uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who faked his death and then went undercover to lead this crusade against evil. It's kind of great because QAnon thus incorporates uh, the most popular uh, American conspiracy, the JFK assassination. Now, how many people believe in QAnon? It's very difficult to say, but certainly it adds to the general distrust of the government, which is not something we need a whole lot of these days. A uh, QAnon supporter has um, uh, uh, won her primary and will be running for Congress this year, at least one. <clears throat> Some elements of QAnon, by the way, embrace the lizard people conspiracy, which illustrates another aspect of conspiracism that Belief in conspiracies is kind of like eating potato chips. It's really hard to stop with one. In fact, studies on people believing conspiracies find that if you've gone down one rabbit hole, you're highly likely to believe in other conspiracies as well. If you saw the excellent documentary on the modern flat earth movement, Beyond the Curve, which I believe is still on Netflix, it's obvious that for many, flat earthism is just the conspiracy du jour. They already were pretty well wired into a conspiracy network and embraced several others. So conspiratorial thinking becomes not so much a rabbit hole, but a prairie dog village. So many holes, so many conspiracies, and many more things to talk about. So let me sit down with my friend Patrick and talk about some of them. Well, that was absolutely de delightful, Jeannie. Thank you so much. It was quite illuminating. I do know a lot about conspiracy. Well, I did before this. I know a whole lot more now. For those people who are listening to this live, if you have any questions for Dr. Scott, uh, just post them on the YouTube chat feature and they will be forwarded to me. And as time allows, we will ask answer as many as we can in the time that we have left. But I have a couple of questions for you, Dr. Scott, if you don't mind. A very simple one is, why do people believe in conspiracy theories? Well, why not? <laughs> um, they're, they're a, a, very, a very frivolous reason is, is that they're kind of fun. Um, yeah. And uh, actually some of the polling data one can be a little suspicious. Uh, I saw one poll, for example, that asked about lizard people. Uh, this was a poll conducted in Great Britain and like 7% of the people said they believed in lizard people. I don't think so. I think, um, you know, s I think some of that response is just people playing with the, uh, the pollsters, yeah. but I, in a more serious vein, um, uh, when I look at, at conspiracies in general and uh, people who believe in conspiracies, whether warranted or not, power comes to mind. The people who really are involved in conspiracies, you know, the, the VW manufacturers, the tobacco uh, manufacturers and so forth, um, they're seeking power or they're seeking to retain power. And many of the people who believe in conspiracies, whether warranted or not, like I say, uh, seek power or seek some sort of control over their lives. It's a perfectly reasonable um, uh, human emotion. Um, a lot of us feel that we don't have a lot of control over our lives. Um, interestingly enough, there, there's a fair amount of social science and psychological research showing that people who tend to embrace various kinds of pseudosciences uh, you know, ESP or um, past lives and so forth and so on, tend to feel 
not all of them, but tend to feel that they have very little control over their own futures, over their own lives. And belief in conspiracies can give a person a feeling that they they have more control, that, that they know something that other people don't know. Um, the, our friends over at the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, uh, which is a website that people should check if they're interested in pseudosciences of various sorts, including uh, conspiracies, have a very interesting uh, uh, conspiracy pyramid in, in which they have the conspirators at the top, at the apex of the pyramid, the sheeple who believe in those conspiracies at one end, and the, you know, army of light, if you will, the, the people who know the truth about these conspiracies. And if you look at yourself as part of the army of light, if you look at yourself as one of the people who understands the truth about this, this gives you a feeling of importance. It also gives you a community. Uh, I mentioned in my talk, uh, the um, Flat Earth uh, uh, video, uh, Beyond the Curve, which is excellent, a really, really good documentary. And it's very, very clear when you watch this documentary that these people are all good friends. They go to conventions, they see their old friends, they give each other big hugs. Well, maybe with COVID, we don't do so much of that anymore, but we're social primates. Of course, you seek community. And if you seek community among people who believe in conspiracies, you're gonna believe in conspiracies. So there's there are lots and lots of reasons, both social as well as psychological, for why people embrace uh, conspiracies. And I mean, Patrick, you're a psychologist yourself. You've you've done a lot of thinking about this. What, you know, the, I'm actually approaching this more as an amateur compared to you. What, what, what do you, why do you think people embrace conspiracy theories? Oh, a uh, few reasons. You, I believe you already nailed it. Uh, oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not on. Oh, you're on. I can do it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Was, oh, a couple of reasons come to mind. You you mm -hmm. pointed out one of them. It's uh, the people mm -hmm. I'm aware of who who are big believers in conspiracy theories. They tend to be. Uh, I've seen them as clients, as patients. Uh, have a remote a place in a remote part of the mountains in California. <clears throat> that seems to be like some mecca for conspiracy theories among the neighbors up there. When when they choose to talk to me, they will often talk about it. And these are tend to be disenfranchised people anyway, um, uh, for various reasons. Either their their jobs were they have low paying jobs, or their jobs were eliminated due to a whole lot of factors. So they they feel disenfranchised, and um, I, I don't want to oversimplify it, somebody's poverty. But, you know, there's a possibility they could perhaps learn new job skills, but it's for them, it's easier for them just to blame somebody else. You know, my father, uh, I don't live in coal mining country, but I'll use that as an example. My grandfather was a coal miner. My father was a coal miner. Now I don't have a job as a coal miner. It's somebody's fault. So they look for that. And as you pointed out, there's the social interaction, too, because they tend to know each other. And another factor that's, <clears throat> I think, very important is that by our very nature, because we've survived as a species, you know, we're a pattern-seeking pattern species. So mm -hmm. they see all yeah, these, so these so. isolated little events, and it's like those puzzles we had when we were kids where you just fill in the dots and you make a bird or something, and they fill in all those dots, and they come up with some grand conspiracy. That's yeah, I mean, I, I think I think your your point about pattern seeking is very is very trenchant. Um, it probably is highly adaptive too. Um, but we all want to make sense of the world. Yeah. We all want to make sense of the world, and it's very easy to uh, to go along with your the members of your social group, with your friends, your family, the people you hang out with. If there's a tendency for people not to be terribly analytical about new ideas, then the tendency is probably to go along with, you know, what you hear from your, your social group. What many of us in the skeptics community are trying to encourage people to do is do the hard work of really trying to look dispassionately at these kinds of issues. Um, there is a... Uh, 
psychological, actually social psychological term called confirmation bias, which refers to looking at information through a filter of your own particular views, whether ideological, um, values-based, uh, or even your group identification, really. Uh, confirmation bias can cause you to overlook things that you should be considering when you are evaluating claims. You know, one of the uh, one of the issues in American uh, politics today, and by the way, there's lots and lots of conspiracies that have to do with politics, certainly. But one of the um, one of the issues that uh, has just surfaced again is the question of collusion between the Trump administration and the Russians during the 2016 election. Now, pretty much everybody agrees that the Russians tried to interfere. The question is, did the Trump administration actually collude with the Russians to do this? Now, if you're a Democrat, uh, it's almost part of your group identification to answer that question, yes, we simply, you know, we simply don't have the information yet. The, the evidence is waiting to be discovered, but you know, there is collusion and, and we will find it out. If you're a Republican, part of your identity is to look at the same suite of facts and say, oh, it's the Democrats and the what they call the deep state, uh, the administ the uh, uh, civil service, uh, the, the people who manage and run and, and make our government work. The deep state and the Democrats uh, are, have a conspiracy to try to um, uh, get rid of Trump or make him an ineffective president. Uh, part of, you know, <laughs> depending on whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you're gonna look at the same set of, of data. Uh, through those filters. Uh, there's gonna be a confirmation bias and it's a very natural thing to do. One of the things that we as scientific skeptics try to do is get people to rise above those natural tendencies and try to use critical thinking, to try to use a, a more analytic approach and to try to look for the evidence that refutes your point of view. Okay. So yeah, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of reasons why people uh, believe in conspiracies. And like I say, not every single one of them has a tinfoil hat on. That's true. And I want to clarify something uh, regarding my neighbors in my remote area of, of the mountains in California. They're nice enough people. It sounds like I was just kind of denigrating them. They believe things I don't believe. Um, but I feel compelled to point out that um, should I get a flat tire, or should I have a problem, they would certainly be willing to help me. And somebody who lost his coal mining job somewhere in Appalachia, it might just be over simplistic for me to say, well, he could just learn a new job skill. There are a whole lot of factors in place that make that very difficult. But my point is when somebody's become disenfranchised uh, politically or economically, it's not uncommon for somebody to look for somebody to blame. And sometimes that person to blame is part of a conspiracy. And I do have a few questions for you here. And I also want to take this opportunity to tell people who are watching this that the Commonwealth Club is a wonderful organization. Uh, if you felt inclined to, I do encourage you to contribute to, to join, join the Commonwealth Club. There are some benefits to that. Eventually, we will be having in-house presentations again. I don't see them on the horizon, but, but they're out there somewhere. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, uh, I'm looking at my cell phone. That's where I'm getting them. Does government promote conspiracy um, by violating the public trust? I, I'm not sure if the person phrased that in, in the way that he or she intended. Um, the, the first part, government conspiracies, don't hold your breath on government conspiracies. Uh, the government is very big, it's unwieldy, it's got, well, I, I don't know, maybe your local school board is part of your government, but I'm assuming he's talking about the federal government. Okay. And the probability of anybody keeping a secret for very long is really small. Um, so conspiracies, big government conspiracies, they do exist, you know, COINTELPRO was a thing. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover did spy on uh, on um, uh, everybody. <laughs> that, was, that was maintained as as uh, secrets. Some of us old timers remember J. Edgar Hoover. And, I remember uh, him. Yeah. Um, and then the question of the public trust. Uh, I think the public trust is very easy to lose 
And I think that's one of the societal problems that we have today, that because of various things that have gone on, not just in the last four or eight years, but the last 20 years, uh, mm -hmm. there has been a lot of decline in uh, public trust in the government. And part of that has been um, poor leadership on the part of, of many political leaders. Uh, and part of it, I think, has also been the growth of unwarranted conspiracy theories. Uh, if you ever really get into the rabbit hole, <laughs> I mean, you asked me to give this talk, so I had to do a lot of <laughs> on conspiracy theories that I hadn't really done. And it's astonishing the number of conspiracies that people imagine um, that are attributed to the government. And, you know, like I say, the bigger the institution, the more people who are involved, um, the uh, more the variance of dedication to the conspiracy. I mean, if you're looking at, at WHO or some other um, uh, governmental uh, conspiracy, you're gonna have some people who really are really into it and other people who really aren't and leaks are gonna come, okay? It's not gonna be able to maintain for very long. So, you know, public trust is an important thing. Conspiracies can contribute to that, but I don't know which way the arrow goes. The arrow probably goes both ways. Yes. There's probably not a simple cause and effect. Yes. Well, uh, I have another question. I think we're running out of time. Um, I think we have interesting. I'm checking my my <laughs> messages, and I actually got you know I, I'm on. I get messages from the Los Angeles Times, and actually their their headline was almost like a conspiracy, uh, refuting what you'd said earlier. Their headline said, "Wearing masks work." <laughs> So, uh, but here another question that comes in is, but why should we pay attention to conspiracy theories? Why has it become? I mean, they've been around forever. We we know about the book written, you know, the in the 1950s, but they certainly come into prominence now. And, and why do you think we should be paying attention to them? Because they have consequences. Some of them, some of them don't, and in, in, or some of them have very few consequences. I mean, if you think that um, that uh, uh, zoologists are covering up evidence for Bigfoot, it's probably not going to make a big difference in the American public. But if you think that um, Hillary Clinton is uh, the head of a uh, sex child sex abuse ring operating out of a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C., um, you might show up with the rifle someday, as a guy did a couple of years ago, and shoot the place up. I mean, there are, you know, there are people who act on cons conspiracies that can be quite significant. Uh, those poor souls who thought that um, hydroxyquinine was an effective uh, cure or treatment for uh, prevention, actually, in their case, for uh, COVID-19, uh, and killed themselves by uh, consuming uh, aquarium supplies. I mean, you know, misinformation and conspiratorial thinking has consequences that can be very, very serious. There is a broader uh, worry that um, you one might have about conspiratorial thinking, and that it, it reflects on some of our conversation earlier in this hour. It reflects upon the lack of critical thinking skills of many people. And that is a matter of concern for the whole country because we really need people to be thinking critically about a lot of issues that affect American society. Energy, the food supply, um, uh, our relationships with other nations, things like immigration. All of these have components that there, there's factual information, there's empirical information that although they will not determine our answers to these societal problems, must inform our answers to these societal problems. Yeah. Um, what is the real evidence about immigrants taking American jobs? Well, there's, there's data on that. We can, we can look at that data critically and come up with a conclusion. So we need critical thinking in this country okay. and people who exhibit these conspiratorial uh, tendencies, if you will, uh, of, of believing in and spreading, uh, especially multiple conspiracy be beliefs, are really um, undermining that need.
You look like you're ready to ask another question. Well, no, I was actually, you sort of answered it, uh, the question I was, I was uh, thinking about, which was yeah. by their very nature, conspiracy theories, <clears throat> I mean, they're, the closed kind that we're talking about are really not amenable to uh, the scientific process because if I understand you correctly, and correct me if, I, if I'm mistaken, is it's a closed belief system. So there isn't any way to challenge somebody's belief in a, in a conspiracy theory that's really not substantiated. The lizard people, for instance, or QAnon uh, to come to mind. And I do think of that poor troubled soul who thought he was gonna save all of these young children who were victims of pedophiles and he showed up at the, the pizza parlor in Washington DC, doesn't even have a basement and I uh, showed up with guns. Of course, terrified the customers and the employees who ran out of the building and the police were called, he was arrested. <clears throat> in a strange way, he thought he was doing a good thing, mm -hmm. uh, saving children from the horrors of the Clintons and all of these other other evil doers. Uh, so I I keep going back to you know the scientific process, a way to evaluate where you can evaluate the VW, you know what what they did to to cover up <clears throat> their emissions test. But is there a way to approach these people in a way that's reasonable? The ones I have met who believe these are actually nice enough people, likable people. Uh, how would you how would you consider approaching them? My experience has been uh, with the creation and evolution controversy. Um, I spent the majority of my professional life uh, dealing with this issue at the National Center for Science Education. And um, you know, I have said for years that information, facts, science, um, is necessary but not sufficient if you're going to change somebody's mind. No. Um, in the case of, of creationists, there is a very good reason why they don't accept evolution. These are people who, because of their particular uh, religious beliefs, their particular conservative Christian beliefs, which are not typical of Christians in general, my theologian uh -huh. friends would want me to say that very quickly, but their particular religious beliefs hold that if evolution is true, then the Bible is false, there's no God, there's no salvation, they will not be reunited with their loved ones after death, um, there is no moral guidance, uh, society would crumble. Uh, there's a lot of very, very, very good reasons why evolution can't be true. Uh -huh. If evolution is true, they lose big, is basically the problem. So you can shovel all the information about the length of the Cambrian explosion or you know, you know, Hox genes and how they, their relationship to body plans and how this is not, you know, this is relevant to the argument from design. You can talk till you're blue in the face about this, but just like the conspiracy types that we are talking about, there's always an, an explanation. There's always a, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but yeah. there, there, there's a, there's a refusal to accept any of the science because accepting the science creates great dissonance for views that are extremely important to them. Uh, yeah. Ideological views, in this case, religious ideology. I could tell you the same story about climate change deniers, um, where the ideology is primarily economic, it's sort of a free market fundamentalism uh, and uh, other identi group identity. But the point being that you have to deal with the underlying issues. Yeah. Before you can, be, before the science has a chance, shall we say, to uh, to make a difference in somebody's conclusions. Okay. I'm I'm a uh, a dreadful optimist, if you will. Um, I'm convinced that you know if you develop good trust relationships with people, you've got good relationships with your conspiracist uh, uh, neighbors up in the hills. I have good relationships yeah. with creationists because I treat them properly. Um, yeah develop good relationships of trust. You can start a dialogue, you can start a conversation and you can make headway eventually, but it but, is going to require compromises. Well, we have a few more questions here. Another one, is there any data on educational background and belief in these extreme conspiracies? 
the data that I've seen, and, and there's plenty more surveys that I'm not familiar with, but the data that I have seen shows that um, educational range is very wide. You have um, PhDs who are promoting, and physicians and people who have high educa- high levels of education promoting conspiracies. You know, I mean, Andrew Wakefield has a has an MD degree, and he's the the founder of the. Uh, uh, unfortunate uh, uh, view that has been making the rounds that uh, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine causes autism, which is unwarranted. This is not true. But so you do find people with um, lots of education promoting these beliefs. They tend to be, they tend to be at the um, uh, uh, leaders, shall we say, the first tier, as it were, of, um, uh, of conspiracy um, belief. The the vast majority of the people who embrace especially more than one conspiracy tend to not be as well educated, but you know it, it's not it's not accurate to say that only dumb people believe conspiracies because that isn't the case. It's not so much a matter of education so much as how you approach the information you have. There are some philosophers of science in fact who have looked at uh, conspiracy and as philosophers of science do, uh, they have been concerned with, um, you know, what is the, what, what is the internal logic? What is the process? Um, there's a couple of philosophers of science who believe that uh, conspiracy believers have a, a, if I can remember the quote, a crippled epistemology. These are people who just aren't thinking straight about stuff. Uh, they believe in contradictory things. They believe in the collusion, uh, I'm sorry, not, the convolution uh, that I was describing in, in my former talk. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's um, there's a lot of reasons, you know, why why people uh, embrace these ideas, and, and you can't just boil it down to education. Yeah. Okay. And here's another question. There's a few come in uh, since you answered the last one. Do nations weaponize conspiracies to disrupt other countries? I don't know. I don't know. I think somebody who studies this matter in more detail might know. I do know that there are scholars who have looked at cross-cultural conspiracies, which I, as a, as an anthropologist, I find really fascinating. I would, uh, I'm I would curious. love to know more about that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we still have a few minutes left. Um, I'm going back to something that you actually have addressed, but maybe you could kind of synopsize it in a just a very straightforward way. Why are they so popular? Why are conspiracies so popular, particularly right now, as opposed to maybe 50 or 60 years ago? It would be interesting to um, to actually uh, collect some data Perhaps some of the scholars in this field have done so. I would be interested in that. But I don't know whether the premise of the question is actually accurate. Are there really more conspiracies now than there were 20 years ago? There have been conspiracies um, certainly since the, you know, well, there there were conspiracies among the founding fathers, obviously. Uh, But I, I I think maybe it appears to be more conspiracies these days because it's so much easier to spread them. Um, There's a really interesting podcast called Rabbit Hole that I would encourage people listening to our program today to take a look at. It's a series of, I think it's five or six. um, I'm trying to remember who puts it out. I'm embarrassed to say, sorry folks, I'm giving you credit, but if you look up Rabbit Hole podcast, it'll show up sooner or later. And what they do is they take a look at how social media has really shaped and augmented conspiratorial thinking. Uh, just the if you look at YouTube, we're we're going to be on YouTube, so here we go. Um, but <laughs> it'll be interesting to see what the YouTube algor- algorithm suggests to people after watching our show. But um, if you look at the YouTube algorithms um, for recommending programs to you. You, as as the rabbit hole podcast uh, describes over several uh, episodes, it leads you deeper and deeper and deeper into the particular rabbit hole of conspiracy. Um, it, it's it's a wonderful series, and it really illustrates how social media today has increased the um, 
uh, visibility and probably the adherence of people, the number of people who adhere to various conspiracies. Okay, thank you. And I believe, uh, Dr. Scott, I uh, believe that is the last question. And I uh, want to thank you so much. It was Your talk was absolutely wonderful, uh, very illuminating. Um, we didn't get to the Illuminati, but maybe next time. <laughs> uh, it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Jeannie. And uh, to those of you who are watching this either live or you watch it on YouTube, again, please consider donating to the um, Commonwealth Club. It's a nonprofit organization. It's been around for well over 100 years. It is a wonderful uh, venue for ideas. Thank you very much. And I hope all of you have a wonderful day. <laughs> Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Dan Ashley, the evening news anchor for ABC 7 News in San Francisco, and I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe, healthy, and comfortable during these very challenging times. I am also a proud board member of the Commonwealth Club, one of our most important Bay Area institutions. The club has been hosting wonderful events with exciting speakers and topics in the Bay Area for over a century. In times of crisis, good information and strong connections in our community are especially important. And during the current COVID-19 crisis, the club has really stepped up. Since March 6th, the club has brought you over 100 live streamed events with speakers and panelists, including past governors, secretaries of state, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, mayors, county supervisors, respected medical experts, the president of the University of California, experts on anxiety and happiness in times of stress, and many, many more. Every program includes a live chat. So you and viewers all over the Bay Area and beyond have been able to ask these experts the questions that are on your minds. Every program has been neutral and unbiased in true Commonwealth Club style to get to the bottom of the issues that are so drastically affecting our lives. The club has done all this public service despite being profoundly affected by the crisis. The inability to hold events for the past two months has forced the club to cut its budget and staffing by 50%. The remaining staff are working from home to bring the community these valuable and informative live streamed programs. The club needs your support to continue its shelter at home programming. Please make a tax deductible donation to the club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the Commonwealth Club website commonwealthclub.org. We need the club to be here in the months and years ahead to help inform and educate as we figure out how to get our society and our economy safely moving again, consider changes to the way we live and work as a result of this crisis and take steps to prevent a future pandemic. Once again, please support the Commonwealth Club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the website commonwealthclub.org. I want to personally thank you for supporting one of our community's truly great organizations. I'll see you on ABC 7 News and at the Commonwealth Club. Stay safe.